today's social media personalities have extreme power when when you don't lie to your audience when you only tell them about products that you believe in people trust you and they feel like they know you right they watch they watch everyone so much that they feel like that they know this person and businesses know that but politicians on the right do not know that that is one thing that we do very very poorly on the right we do not properly use um, social media personalities and that's one thing that baker and i have been working with we vote for america let's go welcome to says we got a special guest today jason wilson we're going to talk about some outdoor stuff some voting stuff uh, but before we get into all that um tell me about yourself where'd you grow up Man, I'm a Georgia boy through and through. Been here most of my life. I've been fortunate to travel a lot of the world, but home is definitely Georgia, so the southeast. What part of Georgia? Uh, near Savannah. You know, most people don't know where Buddy is. You know, the mm. Onion City. Oh yeah. But you just tell people Savannah. So, yeah, that's it. Well, I grew up eating those because my grandmother was a big fan. I grew up in uh, Greenville, South Carolina. So. Oh yeah, nice <clears throat> man. Yeah. Well, it is now not so much back then, but, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, what'd you do as a kid in high school? Like what'd your parents do? And my dad was a farmer. My mom was a florist. You know, we didn't definitely didn't have a silver spoon, you know, growing up in South Georgia, it's all about football, right? It's still all about football in Georgia. So, you know, you played all the sports, you went hunting, fishing, and that's, you know, there was no, uh, skateboard parks, hell there was no pavement in south georgia you know so uh, yeah it was all about the outdoors mm. and uh when you say the outdoors i mean <clears throat> i remember growing up in that same general area in the 80s and 90s and outdoors meant if it's daylight get the fuck out of the house or get out or, of the house or you're, ca- you're gonna catch a beating like you're not sitting around the yeah house. Ex- exactly get out of the house you know you're nine years old they give you you know you got your gun your box of shells we'll see you in mm. dark yeah yeah yeah, you know, yeah I mean, out I re- or go fishing it's so funny i remember being like 9 10 11 12 over at my grandfather's house <clears throat> and he was like yeah the 22 is over there and there's a bunch of ammo in the yeah. safe you guys just, and we would just go out back and draw targets on cardboard nail them to a tree and just shoot them for hours at a time yeah and absolutely uh, that was a completely normal thing to do nobody ever got i, I don't think uh country boys get fucked up by uh by guns too much to be honest because they know how they operate well, you know, uh, it's crazy when I tell people you used to be able to buy the brick of 500 at TGNY mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. 399 yeah, yeah, Like, you know, yeah. I, I remember I remember when they made it up like $8. I was so mad. Yeah. But, yeah, you, you went and bought that brick of bullets for, for the week, and, dude, you were set. I wish I had known about steel targets back then. I just didn't know because we were just shooting into trees and shit like that, which is probably not great for the, the land or the trees. But, um, yeah, I would have just, like – my, and my dad had a body shop, so I would have grabbed some scrap metal off of something and, and brought it down there. I never even thought about it because plinking targets with a twenty two and uh, on steel, you can pretty much just go pick the projectiles up off the ground and throw them away if you want. And it's not that big a deal. Yeah, you know, I mean, we were we were shooting targets, but we were shooting squirrels or what? I mean, I actually know what a red bird tastes like, right? If you shot it at my granddad's house, you know, you were going to eat it. So you quickly learn not to shoot the red bar- bird. They're pretty terrible. But, uh, yeah, me and my cousin, we terrorized 22s. Same, same thing. Mm-hmm. Same thing you did in South Carolina. Yeah, and then we would go up to uh, – I don't, I don't know what the fishing is like in Georgia. We never went that way. We always went north into North Carolina into the, like, Black Mountain and shit up there and up into the – up into the mountains and well mountains you know uh, once i went out west i realized those weren't really mountains in the appalachians but um <clears throat> yeah we would go up in the mountains and uh and fish for trout which was uh nice i mean like you're, you're not going to beat that just fresh rainbow trout right out of the stream and you just got them yeah. right there and throw them on a, on some coals i mean it's it's it was a good time growing up i feel like kids don't really do that that much anymore so the the first job i had actual job was catching catfish out of my dad's pond, cleaning them, put them in 12 ounce packages and selling them to a little restaurant, little fried chicken restaurant. Mm-hmm. That's when I was 13. And when I, by the time I was 15, I had five restaurants. And my granddad at restaurant two and three, you know, if you got behind, granddad would meet you when you got off the bus and you would go down and catch up. But by the time you got to five restaurants, the fun was gone, right? It was using the traps to catch them and three days a week you were cleaning fish yeah but you know this is in the this is in the 80s dude i was making four or five hundred bucks a week 
uh, adults weren't making that much money. And, uh, you know, my dad would let me spend $25 a week. You have no idea how hard it is to spend $25 a week back then. Yeah, so, but literally, literally the first job I ever had was, uh, was catching fish out of a nine acre pond and, uh, cleaning them and selling them. Well, that's the dream, right? I mean, yeah. um, the ability, I mean that, that at its, at its core, that's what, um, what do you call it? I guess paleo conservatism or libertarianism. That's really what it is. Is being able to turn, take your will and your labor and apply it to the earth and turn that into money or whatever, right. For yourself. That that's kind of, that's kind of the dream. I mean, I feel like there aren't a whole lot of opportunities in modern society to teach kids that because we just don't do the same stuff that we used to, but there are here and there. I mean, you know, uh, I, I know that, I know, I know parents who use, um, uh, like device screen time as currency instead of actual money, which is probably a smart idea. Like you, you want to keep them off there as much as possible. But, um, I think making kids work for the privilege to use the screens lets them know that it's a, it's a privilege. It's not like a daily thing, right? It's not, this isn't, this isn't your life. This is something that it's a nice treat now and then, but you got to go do your fucking work first. Absolutely. And, you know, we, we had our chores that we did. uh, But, you know, the entrepreneur side of things that came pretty early, but it's all about what you can uh, make out of your rocks and sticks and growing your dirt, right? Mm. That's basically what a country's wealth is worth. And and in the country for me, you know, it it was the pond with the catfish in it. And uh, yeah, it was just, it was a different way of growing up. You didn't worry about the kid. You didn't worry about people molesting kids. You didn't worry about craziness. I went to high school with two guns hanging in the back mm-hmm. of the windshield. Like, you know, every now and then a principal might say, Hey, you know, take the guns down. We don't want somebody breaking into your truck. Nobody was going to break in your truck. We went, we went hunting and fishing, you know, hunting in the morning, fishing in, in the afternoon, whatever. Yeah. And it was common knowledge that everyone had guns in their truck and we didn't have any crazy shootings. You know, it's, it's not about the guns. It's about the people. Yeah, we like I graduated high school in 99 and the only the first I didn't we didn't hear anything. We did the same. I had an old F100 uh, with big ass tires on it and uh, a shotgun in the back. Right. Not not for yeah. not for like defense or anything. I was a teenager just for like shooting. Yeah. like if I feel like yeah. if we're out driving around in the woods somewhere and I feel like getting out and shooting the trees yeah. or something, that's what I'm going to do. Right. Um, exactly. But. Then after um, <laughs> after Columbine, it started to get weird. Like every now and again, somebody would like, "Oh, this guy's got a knife in his car." It's like, so so the fuck. It wasn't in his pocket. He right. wasn't like stabbing actively stabbing somebody with it. What the fuck are you talking about? Even even when they would occasionally search the school for drugs, like once a year, you'd have a, a random search. We didn't really have a drug problem in our school, but you, when you emptied your pocket, everyone emptied their pocket, and you know your knife was just laying on your desk, and nobody said anything about your knife. Yeah. I mean, you used it and used it in shop class. Yeah, it shows you uh, what I think is a very important lesson, and it's that <clears throat> um, there is a relationship between the amount of responsibility we entrust people with as they're growing up and the amount they are responsible, right? Um, like if you shield and shelter a child, um, uh, there's so much fallout from that. One, they don't know how to handle a responsibility responsibly at any point in their life probably, right? If they don't learn that at a younger age. Um, because if you don't, it's just like training. You learn when the stakes are low and then you operate when the stakes are high. That's how it's supposed to work. Um, and another thing from that is like allowing kids to fail at shit is so important because if the first time they fail is when they're like 26, because they get coddled through school, they get coddled through That's college, right. then they fail for the first time at 26 and they have no idea how to handle it. And they have a breakdown and they're living back at home now. It's like, man, what? that, that seems to me like a failure of our culture to make grown fucking men who are capable of going out into the world and being grown men. We don't have time to babysit 26 year olds. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're crippling the kids today. They're literally crippling the kids today. And, uh, you know, I was great. I had amazing parents, uh, super dyslexic. So I went to a private tutor every day of my life from the fourth to the 12th grade. And thank goodness for my parents. But one of the biggest things they instilled in me is, you know, you don't fail until you stop trying, right? You fail at something, you get up, you go again. And you learn more lessons out of a failure many, many times, you know, over what if you succeed and it comes easy to you. Um, I'll use that, you know, a lot of teams have lost one game in a football season and that one game taught them the lesson they needed to win the state championship or a national championship. But, uh, if you're not encouraging pushing your kids 
and they're not failing at some point, you're literally crippling your kids. Yeah, and I don't like the one, something that really makes me angry um, and disappointed is how often we as a culture choose to blame millennials and Gen Z. Like, oh, these kids are these kids these days. I mean, it's there's always a, some amount of these kids these days bullshit going on, no matter what. E- e- they could be perfect, and we would still bitch about it. But the main narrative right now is like, oh, these kids don't want to do this. They're not capable of this. It's like, well, who made them? Like, right. you fucking right. made it's- and raised these kids. Who are you blaming? Yeah. Ab- absolutely nothing wrong with the kids. It's the freaking parents, right? And uh, I work a lot with the Mel Blunt Youth Home. And uh, Mel Blunt, uh, he's a Hall of Famer. Uh, his brother Clinton runs it now. And Clinton will tell you point blank, there's nothing wrong with the kids that's in there. It's the freaking parents. And that's literally the problem today is the freaking parents. Yeah, I mean, it's... I get it. I mean, look, a lot of this is a function of... Uh, like, I, I don't think it's... I, to, to me, anyways, I don't think it's super helpful just to say it's somebody's fault. Like, let, let's let's unpack why, right, things are going the way they're going. Because this is why you show your work in math class so the math teacher can come by and look at it and see where you're fucked up. So you can be like, oh, here's where you fucked up. Now you can get it right. Like, just fix that little part. Um, and the way some of it is just circumstance, right? Like the fact that most people have to have both parents working just to survive in, in today's economy. Not, and I don't mean just the last three and a half years. I'm talking about modern economy, right, in the last 30, 40 years. Um, <clears throat> losing that, like, solidified nuclear presence at home with mom at home. You get home from school, mom's already there doing shit. She's like, you're doing this and this, get the fuck out of the house, whatever. And then the impending dad's coming home soon. You know that there's going to be trouble, <laughs> right? Um, I think that's a really important system. I think those guardrails are really important for kids, not to keep them out of trouble, but to teach them how to navigate trouble, right? That's not the same thing. Uh, this, this helicopter parenting where you're hovering over them all the time and like, Oh, bubble wrap. Let's get, don't, don't get, don't skin your right. knee. Like, fuck that. Knees are meant to be skinned motherfucker. Right. Um, <laughs> and you know, I think that part of it is circumstance. So parents like and, there, and there's not much you can do about it i mean frankly a- unless you're willing to live uh an extremely austere life uh, in most cases both parents are going to be working like uh, that won't be the case uh when i have kids because i i do really well but i uh, for most people that's going to be the case both parents have to work so how do you navigate that right like how do you continue to get all the benefits from the nuclear family when time together is at a premium now you know what i mean Right. One, th- I don't want to get off on a tangent, but one thing today, you know, the way they throw pharmaceuticals at these kids, right? Mm-hmm. You know, this kid's got this, this kid's got that. No, maybe he needs his ass tore up and uh, that, that'll that help. But, or boys, we, we are rambunctious. We, we just do it. That's part of being a fucking boy when you grow up and uh, the schools and the parents are just throwing pharmaceuticals at kids, putting them on Ritalin, putting them on Adderall. Uh, the amount of pharmaceuticals being pushed on our kids today is ridiculous. And I, again, I blame that on the parents. Yeah, that part is, um, so the circumstance is what it is. The solution for a, a great deal of people has been uh, pharmaceuticals and screen time. Or in our e- right. e- even in our generation, there was the latchkey thing, right? Where That's right. you let yourself into the house. There's a key under a rock somewhere. You let yourself into the house and you watch TV or something like Ray. It's, it kind of started in the late or in the, in the mid nineties, I think is when that really started. Right. Um, and you know, that's an option. It's an option. And, and, and it's not a good one, frankly. Right. I mean, right. like, especially, I, I don't know about for girl. I'm not, a, I'm not a girl, so I don't know how any of that works, frankly. Mm-hmm. Um, but for young boys, man, you just can't do that. There, there is, there's no version of a a young boy, young man, if he's in his uh, uh, tween or teen ages, who's not doing something actively on a regular basis, who's who's well adjusted. It's not possible, right? right. It's just not biologically. That's not how we're designed to operate. We're designed to be moving around for like eight to ten hours a day. You know what I mean, give or take, depending right. on the time of year and and the weather and shit like that. But about eight to 10 hours a day, we're meant to be outside for six or more hours a day uh, uh, in most cases. And it's, 
I don't like, like n- none of the systems that we have as a society support that biologically, but, which is not shocking because no. we don't understand biology at all. Apparently we don't know what a fuck a woman is, but right. well, some of us do, but uh, uh, we don't do anything to actually support the biological nature of human beings that we're responsible for anymore. Right. We put them in a classroom for eight and a half, nine hours a fucking day with no sunlight. You know what I mean? And then they get home and it's like, Oh, we're doing homework, which I hate. I, I'm against homework. I think it's, yeah. it teaches, it teaches kids that even when they go home and they're on their own time, they still owe fucking time to the man that they work for. Right. I think that's a really right. bad lesson for them to learn. So at, from the bottom with, with parenting options, right, uh, to, to keep the kid entertained and all this stuff, it's expensive and limited in a lot of cases. And then we put them into school. They don't do a very good job. Forget about the education part. Like any, you can, a kid can read a book and figure shit out, to be honest, with a little bit of guidance. You don't, you don't, it's not rocket surgery. But keeping them sitting in a seat for 90 minutes in three or four different periods during an eight hour day is ridiculous. I mean, there's no, they're, they're there's, not designed for that. Yeah, there's no version of a six to 12 year old boy that can even think about doing that shit. So <clears throat> a kid that wants to get up and do backflips and run up the side of the wall gets a little fidgety in a seat and they're like, Oh, we probably give this kid some pills. Right. Uh, yeah. cause it's unacceptable that he's not doing what we want him to do. It's like, have you ever met uh, uh, an Australian shepherd before? Put that motherfucker in a studio apartment and see how he behaves. Like, this is just biology, right? Well, if you look at the way we were in high school, today I would be in alternative school. You know, it was nothing. Mm. I mean, you get in a fight with somebody on a Wednesday, you go to the principal's office, you get three licks each. By Friday, you'd be riding around in the truck together. Mm. You know, I mean... And it just happens, you know, you're, you're boys. It's a, it's a pecking order thing. If you ever got in a fight at football practice, they'd put you in the middle of the circle, right? Mm-hmm. The coach would let you fight it out so neither one of you could move anymore, right? Next day you're back and you're friends again. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's shocking to look at the way kids, the way they, normal things that boys do are, are viewed today and how you'll end up in a damn alternative school. Sometimes people need punching in the face. You know, they just do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes each of us do to be honest yeah especially at that age i mean <clears throat> it's um it's it's like just a it's just a dog pack man that's all that's it right. is it's all it is it's it's uh pheromones and testosterone and everybody's smelling and sniffing and, and yep. growling at each other that's and it. sometimes you got to bite somebody and then you just get back to business <laughs> afterwards it's not that big a deal man and the yeah, big exactly the the, the more that you forcefully abstain young boys from that activity, the angrier and more violent they get as they get older, because there's no outlet for it, especially not a healthy exactly. outlet. So, you know, to that point, there are some things you can do. Getting your kids outdoors is great. Putting them in jujitsu or something like that, probably great as well. Um, I think being outdoors though, I think is the best. No, maybe, and maybe that's just because I like it more, but that's, that's, that'll be my strategy. I'm sure. Um, because mm-hmm. I like being out there and I think, you know, uh, my, my grandfather taking me out doing stuff like that all the time was, uh, a, it was a really fun part of my childhood. Like I really enjoyed it. So I think, I think kids like doing shit like that. Mm-hmm. What's the say and teach your kid to hunt and you won't have to hunt your kid. It's yeah. a very true statement. Yeah. I mean, bottom line. Yeah. Um, so speaking of hunting, fishing, whatever, uh, let's get back to you a little bit. So what would you do when you graduated high school? Went to Georgia Southern, uh, opened a business there and uh, the beer, alcohol and beer uh, stores. When they, when they were first coming out, you sold the tobacco and cigarettes, had it on the campus, got a huge degree in social life. Um, you know, as a UPS supervisor after that, you know, owned some bars, lots of stuff, own businesses. I've pretty much been an entrepreneur my entire life. So UPS probably taught me more than everything I learned at Georgia Southern. I had an amazing center manager, taught me human behavior, uh, how to get the most out of your employees. And UPS knows to the half a penny what it costs mm. for a part-timer to, to touch a package. And the efficiency side of things, I mean, those lessons, you can apply that to just about anything that you do. But uh, great, great company, great experience. And uh, yeah, so I would not go back to the corporate world to save my life. When the stock went public, 
you know, all us young guys thought it was going to be great. If you had been there for 10 years, you were multi-millionaire overnight. Mm. And they had to wait a year and a half before they could start selling stocks. So we thought it would be great. You know, all of us are going to move up and get promoted. Year and a half goes by. Everybody starts retiring. Hell, they just started heaping more work on everybody. Mm. I think I was direct supervisor of 14 people. Oh, my God. Uh, when I started, I had uh, 44 people when I left. I was doing payroll in OSHA for 88 uh, employees. So great company. UPS is still a great company, but it's definitely not the same, uh, compared to when the stock went public. 14 is a lot. I mean, if, uh, 14 is a lot span of control is three to five. Typically span of control is a phrase used, uh, by, uh, uh, I guess business, uh, logisticians to sit to like, that's how many people you, one person can effectively manage is three to five people. Oh. Um, 14 is quite a bit. I mean, how do, how do you do, yeah. but the reason is because you have to counsel folks, right? Like maybe it's quarterly, maybe it's monthly, who knows. Right. Um, but you're going to have that that's 14 hours worth of meetings every three months. Right. Just to, just to talk that's to right. your employee. That's, that's a lot, man. Yeah. Throw, throw in OSHA and habits training mm -hmm. and everything else. It, it's a tremendous amount, but the one thing I can say about UPS is my absolute worst employee at UPS will run circles around most people's best employee. Mm. You know, if you ever worked in the morning preload unloading trucks, dude, you could do that and you can do anything you want. Uh, but but just ama amazing employees. And fortunately, we were there at Georgia Southern. So, you know, we had our pick of, of the very best. And uh, my, my test for whether somebody got hired or not, these human resources people would send you idiots all the time. Mm. And after you finish interviewing them, I always put a mop bucket at the end of the, at the, end of the center and uh, as I'm filling out the papers, I'd ask the guy, hey, do you mind running down there and grabbing that mop bucket for me right quick while mm -hmm. I finish filling this out? And if you hustled down there and got the mop bucket and came back, you got the job. If you drug your feet and took your time and acted like I was asking you to do something crazy, you didn't get the job. So I, I could care less about the rest of the interview. What determined whether or not you got the job was how quickly you went and got the mop bucket. Yeah. True story. That's good. Um, what did you what did you do when you left UPS? Hmm. Left UPS, opened bars. So uh, eight people that played for me have now performed at the Super Bowl. Uh, did that for a couple of years. Uh, opened the company, uh, building houses, redoing houses, and uh, ended up with uh, anything. I had a land and timber company after that. Still have it today. But uh, about 10 years ago, I guess, I started with the social media business. And that's really what dominates my time now. So I found a way to make a living hunting and fishing and traveling. Mm. And uh, so we work with a lot of companies, product photos, influencers, pairing the right personality with the right company. And uh, yeah, it's uh, been been pretty amazing, actually. What's the name of the company? Anything social. Anything we do social. we do everything from weed companies to, you know, ocean tamer, bean bags, anything that you can imagine. If it has to do with the outdoors, hunting or fishing, and uh, again, we, we don't really care what you do. We can help you grow your business and pair you with the right influencer. Um, and how does the business work exactly? Like, let's say I've got um, uh, a widget company. Like, how? what's that process look like? So we work with a lot of companies where they put us on retainer, like a Noggin Boss. You've seen the really big hats mm -hmm. that people wear or whatever. The Noggin Boss has us on a retainer. And uh, for example, the Orange Bowl where Georgia played uh, Florida State, we made sure that the Georgia Spike Squad had the noggins on. And uh, we do a, we take a lot of time putting noggins on people that are going to be on television. So they end up, I want to say they had a minute and 38 seconds of airtime during the Orange Bowl. If they had to pay for that, it would have cost them around a half a million dollars. I think we had 380 bucks in it. So again, it's a business development thing for, for noggin boss and just getting their noggins on the right people. And, uh, you know, strike point tackles, another one where we get, get their products in the right people's hands where, where people get exposed to a product. Uh, but, but mainly we pay We develop social media campaigns for companies and use inf the right influencers to grow their company. And then we help influencers brand themselves. You know, it doesn't, you don't really need to be face up, ass down, right? Mm. But we help them brand themselves so that they're marketable and provide value to the company that we pair them with. So we work with around 700 influencers. That's quite a bit. Um, yeah, it's a lot. And, and 
is there a particular, I mean, you, you mentioned hunting and fishing, but is there a particular industry that you focus on or is there, wh- how, how do you decide who, which client to take on, I guess? So these days I pick and choose exactly who I take on. I'm, I'm very blessed. And, uh, you know, Chad and Jenny do some of the other companies, the squirrels pizzas of the world or the plastic surgeons of the world. And I mainly work with the hunting and fishing. And one of the things that we do is we take influencers. We work with four ministries of tourism. So we take influencers to Bermuda or Costa Rica and and you take them into a resort. You promote a fishing charter. Mm. You know, you're paid by the Ministry of Tourism to bring the people in. And uh, while we're there, we're shooting product photos for all of the different influencers who are there. So we're multitasking and you got four or five hours a day that you, you know, get your work done, get everything done. And then the rest of the time you're fishing or doing whatever. So uh, again, found a way to make a living doing what I love. Yeah. That sounds rough. Um... Yeah, but it it can be rough. I mean, don't be fooled by social media, Mm. right? It's definitely better than a cubicle, but last year in January, I think I slept in my bed six days. Mm. And when you start, you know, it's one thing if you're traveling 10 days out of the month, you know, that's about what I want to do. But when you start breaking over that, dude, you're, it, it gets it gets tiring. It gets oh yeah, boring. believe me. I mean, we so we have um, obviously we have a sports show on our network that we do, and now with Hard AF, um, we started signing contracts with um, with universities for their football, basketball, baseball teams, right? So, um, University of Illinois, University of Michigan, Vanderbilt. We got a couple other teed up uh, that we're working on right now, but. Um, it's it's the fall has become kind of like that for us. Uh, it'll be it'll be somewhere between ten and fifteen days every month until football season's over that we're going to be on right. the road. So you know it does right. it does become tedious and expensive too. Like I mean, not just for the company, very expensive. Not just for the company, but like uh, you know, I've got dogs. I got to pay somebody to watch those assholes. Right. Um, it is it is a bit of a struggle sometimes, but it's again I, I agree with you. It's better than sitting in a cubicle. I couldn't do that. I did it for way way better. I did it for one year working for the federal government. And I'm like, nah, this is fucking <laughs> bullshit. I'm done. Do this I'm done. Yeah. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> at any rate, um, so uh, what is it that you've learned? I guess from dealing because uh, this is a this is a relatively new form of marketing and it, I, it happens from time to time, I guess, with creative destruction, like the, a new modality of speaking to getting eyeballs to pay attention to stuff like social media or whatever it is. They pop up all the time. Radio half our print media happen, radio happen, TV happen, cable TV happen. And now the internet's happened and print and TV, print radio, TV, cable TV, they kind of kept the same general marketing packages for decades at a time. Social media is different every six to 18 months, right? The strategies you got to use, um, the algorithms that the social media companies are using and how that feeds into both search engine optimization and search advertising and stuff like that. I mean, you've really got to stay on top of stuff to be good at what you're doing here. Right. So one of the principles that's always going to apply, it takes seven to 31 impressions to get somebody to do something. So that that's been around and, and will not change for a long time. But a few years ago, um, and we, we already knew this, we just didn't realize how bad it was. But a few years ago, we put 1200 people in a room watching their favorite YouTuber for three hours. And their only instructions were, you know, you get to pick your YouTuber, you can skip episodes, you can do whatever you want, just please stay off your phone as much as possible. But you got to watch three hours. We're going to study your heart rate. We're going to study all this as the action goes up, which was a lie. We were studying how they were interacting with the hard ads, how they the organic ad that the personality put in there, mm-hmm. and then the ad that they couldn't skip. And I'm going to use Kelly Young as an example. It was a mattress company. You order it. It comes in the mail. Cut it up. It blows up over two days. You put it on the bed. They had a 30-second hard ad in there. And then Kelly Young talked about it for a minute where – it came, she time-lapsed it blowing up, her dog Finley spotting on the covers as she's making the bed, whatever. And then we had the one that they couldn't skip. And 97% of the people skipped the ad when they could skip it. I think the other 3% thought it was a trick is the only reason they didn't skip it. Mm. 94% of the people watched Kelly Young talk about the mattress for the entire minute. 
4% of those people watched for over 30 seconds and 2% just hit the skip button and went through, went on. And then when the hard ad came on that you couldn't skip, you know what they did? Uh, changed to a new video. Uh, -uh. they picked up their phone. 70% mm. of them picked up their phone, returned their text or whatever and checked it. People will not listen to an ad. If ads worked, television would still be working. So you, the personality, and, and I use the term personality, and you are a personality. You are not an influencer. Influencer is a terrible word. Mm. And when I say Sean Hannity was a radio personality before he became a television personality, same with Tucker or O'Reilly or whoever you want. Mm. Today's social media personalities have larger audiences, exponentially larger audiences than, than Sean Hannity. Think about a Sean Ryan or think about Andy Frisella. And these audiences trust them. You've got over a 90% trust, uh, trustworthiness. They uh, listen to everything that you say. And your favorability rating is over 90% because if not, they hit the unsubscribe, the unfollow or whatever. So today's social media personalities have extreme power. When, when you don't lie to your audience, when you only tell them about products that you believe in, people trust you and they feel like they know you, right? They watch, they watch everyone so much that they feel like that they know this person. And businesses today, Fortune 500 companies, everybody else will tell you, uh, 90, no, I'm sorry, 74% of businesses today will tell you that using social media is a much better way of reaching your customer compared to traditional advertising. And businesses know that, but politicians on the right do not know that. That is one thing that we do very, very poorly on the right. We do not properly use um, social media personalities. And that's one thing that Baker and I have been working with with Vote for America. Mm -hmm. um, but but if you're going to reach people, they're carrying around the great library of Alexandria in their hand. They're, they're not going to go to the 20 years ago. If you wanted to know about the new Ford pickup truck, you had to go to the dealership or buy a magazine or watch the ad. Today, you can pull it up on your phone and you compare it to the Dodge or whatever you want. People's attention span is about this long. Yeah, it's uh, it it is it is until you get their attention, right? Like it, it's that that's the that's the part that I think a lot of people uh, fuck up when they're doing um, uh, whatever you call it. Let's call it personality marketing. But um, to your point, the Obama campaign leveraged social media very well in two thousand eight and twelve, more more so in two thousand eight twelve. They were just against what was a weak candidate in my opinion i, I didn't think romney Ro romney probably, romney was a terrible candidate yeah yeah and then terrible candidate. choosing paul ryan is like what the fuck are you doing man but <clears throat> in 2008 um they had the best digital ground game in the history of american politics e even to this day like nobody's matched them yet um and what they did was something that I guess to some degree, Trump copied later on uh, in 2016 with uh, a couple of different companies. Cambridge Bur Analytica was one of them, but um, they figured out how many counties exactly they needed to target. Oh, we need to win these. Uh, this this election cycle it's 27, 27 counties. We need to win, and we will win the electoral college. But just that's just how the math works out, right? And they spent. They, they did. Uh, complex directional attacks, psychographic stuff, uh, uh, all all sorts of marketing, not not only towards those places, but primarily that was their focus, right? Uh, that's what Obama right. did in 2008. Same exact thing. Um, highly effective, <sighs> but no Republican can figure it out for some reason. I have no idea why uh, they can't. They just can't figure it out. I will say part of the problem is the consultants and the super PACs. Uh, most of the consultants for the billionaires came from one of the big super PACs. And the super, it's very, it's very difficult to calculate social media impact. It's super easy to calculate television views and audience and, and ad spend. And uh, nobody wants to try anything different. And a lot of these billionaires, they're not sitting around, unlike the American public that's on their phone when they get home for a couple hours. Uh, every day. These billionaires aren't, and they don't understand it. They simply don't understand social media or the power because they're, they're, they're not on it the way the public is. And um, it, that, that's one of the biggest problems that we face. And currently the Democrats, you know, you see the Republicans making fun of, oh, they're paying this influencer $20,000 to go to this event. Okay. So what, how much does it cost for a 
30 second ad that reaches 5 million people. How much does it cost for 5 million mailers to be sent out to somebody? This dude's going to be there for four days blasting out how many 30 second ads. And it's all about impressions, just smacking people in the face. People are stupid. They'll believe a lie if you tell them enough times. I mean, they're, they're absolutely, and that's the one thing the left does a great job of. Uh, yeah, they do. I mean, it's and and historically that is the case as well, right? I mean, the left has always been better at propaganda than the right. right. Um, what they what they beat us at, Dan, is they beat us on the, you know, I, I want to say it was energy. So much energy, so much energy, so much energy, and then the day before that, it was joy, joy, mm -hmm. joy. They control the media. They control big tech. They control most of social media. And the one thing the left does better than anything is they they have everyone speak with one voice and they deliver one message. And whereas veterans or, or, or not, not just veterans, but people on the right, we're 10,000 bullfrogs all sitting on our lily pad and we're all delivering a little bit different message and it comes across as noise. It does not have the same impact as that, you know, that message that's in common that's right on point. And when you just pound people with the same message eventually the impressions get through. I mean, hell, there's still people riding down the road wearing a fucking face stopper in a car by themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's just the, 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 that's literally just the way it is. Even for, um, uh, for a warm lead, right? Like that, let, let's say, let me, let me ex explain what that is for a moment, but, um, you are a hunting company and you're talking to a hunter. That's a warm lead. That dude is already interested, maybe not in your specific product, but at least in the general, uh, uh, motif of what you're doing there. Uh, that still is three at a minimum, three to five impressions to get a conversion. And sometimes right. a conversion is just them giving you their email address, not even a sale. Right? So this is just how human psychology works. So when people get all fucking butthurt about this strategy or that strategy, it's like, well, if you want to, it's, it's not enough to be right. You have to explain to people why you're right. right and get them on your side. Right. And not just the people that are near to you either. You, you need to talk to people that are, you know, at least somewhere in the same ballpark and, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs applies to everybody. You should be able to talk to anybody, regardless of what their, regardless of what their social politics are, you should be able to talk to somebody who's struggling to put food on the table. You like, you got to right. be able to have that conversation in a meaningful way that demonstrates your message to them, both with uh, uh, your specific policy and with historical precedent. Like this idea of price controls that's being rolled out by Kamala Harris right now, or raising corporate taxes to 28% or raising the um, capital gains tax to 45%. All of this stuff has been tried before. It has all failed every single time failed. it's ever been tried. Not just failed, but sometimes it's reset currency, right? Like it's it's uh, like in the Diocletian period. It, it's really fucked up some economies for the last two thousand years or so. This isn't new. We've been doing this shit for a while. So, you know, you ha you really have to be able to tailor that message in a way and then pump it into people's brains because it takes. A, that's just how human psychology works. You have to be able to get in there. So I see a lot of people on the right, like, oh, these fucking liberals are running ads ad after ad they're just dominating the media and to me it sounds like loser bullshit like yeah that's what you got to do that's how it works man right well i'm gonna i'm gonna go back to the tea party when the tea party happened everybody was angry people were mad you know and, and you had a up a upwelling of people that showed up they didn't know why they were going to dc but the entire tea party movement that happened there was a lot of anxiety in the country and a lot of people were angry when the Tea Party happened, though, it was the heyday of talk radio and radio and television. That's where people got their, their information from. You didn't have all these other distractions that you have today. And today, our people consume their content differently, right? But the right is continuing to try and advertise to them just as they did when the Tea Party happened, right? They're not using the personalities to talk to the audience. They're trying to run an ad. And if you're mm. running... You know, they're, they're going to spend $2 billion between now and November the 5th. The vast majority of that's going to be on television ads that nobody's watching. If you're running a television ad during Sean Hannity's show telling his voters to register to vote, to get out to vote, you're wasting your money. His, his audience is already registered to vote. They already know who they're going to vote for. And if you're running a YouTube ad, I already told you they're hitting the skip button. Mm -hmm. They're not watching your ad. They're not paying attention to it. And I actually got into it with a billionaire a few months ago and his consultant and 
you know, I was telling them, you know, how we were targeting the hunting and fishing and they're like, oh yeah, we're, we're definitely going to be targeting the pursuit channel and the outdoor channel. I said, well, that's a great idea. If it was, you know, 15 years ago, yeah. people actually, well, I said, I'm as big a sportsman as there is and I don't have either one of them, but you know, I, I watched my favorite YouTuber and uh, people, that's where they get their content. He's, oh yeah, we're going to be spending $22 million on YouTube ads. And I'm like, great. You just told me you're wasting $22 million. Yeah. Well, you just said YouTube was impor important. I said, no, YouTubers are important, not YouTube ads. Mm -hmm. You're And it's, well, our current data is showing that eight to 12% of people are watching the ads all the way through. And I said, well, let me guess, you know, around six or seven o'clock, people are watching them all the way through. Uh, but around 10 o'clock at night, your number's dropping down to two or 3% and it's watching them all the way through. And he's like, yeah, well, how, how did you know that? I said, well, let me explain this. At six o'clock at night, people are getting dinner ready. The baby's crying. They're on the phone. They're in the bathroom. They're taking clothes out of the washer, putting it in the dryer. They're doing anything other than paying attention to that ad that's on television. And you're, that's where it's at. They don't even realize the ad is playing. Yeah. But people who are sitting down at 10 o'clock at night realize there's an ad on and they're clicking through it. So you think that you're getting 8 to 10% of the people that are watching your ad. They're not. They're living yeah. their daily lives and they're busy. They're not watching the ad. Yeah, those static advertisements only worked when everything played in succession in a specific Correct. period of time. From 9 to 10 p.m., this show is going to be on and there's going to be ads in between – the episode like four different ad blocks and if i get up too long and i'm going to miss something right uh right with youtube i can press pause man and come back two days later if i fucking want to right like, it just right i i do it's it's it it's a struggle for me to understand how that hasn't made its way into people's brains because we've been in the podcast game for nine years now right and um luckily when i was vp of marketing black rifle we already we were running the shit, so we knew that it was effective, right? Um, just because we were also doing uh, podcasting and stuff. But most of the companies we talked to about doing similar stuff, and then once uh, me, Ross, and Jared took Drinker Bros out of Black Rifle, and I started marketing it to to ordinary advertising and stuff, it was a struggle to like get them to understand that there's like a hundred thousand plus people that watch my show every day. I, like right. that, that, and, like, and they and, trust and, you and they trust me. It's not like randos wa right. like walking by at the, at the airport or hospital with Fox news on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They get 3 million people watching that show, but how many people are actually going to read some, uh, or see some ad between the segments and buy something off of there. It's not even close to the same. Right. So I'm going to use Andrew Bailey that you had on your show mm -hmm. as an example. And uh, we w went up to uh, Andy Frisella's place, met with him mm -hmm. for three or four hours. And at the time, he was neck and neck. He was in a dogfight. No one picked this dude to win. He was up against a guy who was backed by two billionaires. He ended up being outspent $20 million to $5 million. And again, he's neck and neck. And what we started doing is we started throwing him on your show and Jared, Guns and Gadgets, an armed scholar. Mm -hmm. And we started putting him where those primary voters, the 2A people, the military people were at. So he got to talk to him and he got to talk, he got to talk to the audience for an hour, hour and a half. You know, that's, that's, that's a long time. How much does it cost for that? This guy began to pull away his heaviest web traffic days. Nine, nine of his biggest web traffic days was when he did podcasts that were relate or people that had were involved in vote for America. Mm -hmm. The one out of the 10 days was when he did Andy Frisella show before Andy Frisella got involved in Vote for America and his donations nationwide. You can see the donations nationwide come in and this guy just won his race by 26 points yeah. being outspent four to one. But he went and spoke to the voters where they were at and guns and gadgets. For example, you can see his YouTube video had 700 and something comments in there of people who were from from Missouri. You know, that's my AG. Thank you for, mm. for sticking up for the kids. Thank you for this. And it, it's just understanding where people are consuming their content. And another problem that we have is a lot of these kids that were debate kids that went to college, they volunteered on a campaign when they were in college. And when they graduated, they went to work as an aide or a staffer. Mm. And that's happened for a couple of decades. So now you've got a bunch of people, when you talk about the DC bubble, I really didn't understand how bad it was, but now you've got a lot of people that are really good at getting college degrees, but they've never ran a business. They've never been, they've never, they've been in this isolated bubble of DC 
and they do not understand how the average person is consuming their content. They do not see the guy counting out gas money and change at the store. They don't see the, the mom's debit card not working in the grocery store or the dollar store. And when you hear the term DC bubble, it is, it is beyond belief how big that bubble is. And a lot of the advisors and consultants never, never had the real jobs. You know, they've just come up through this chain and, and they, they cannot relate with you and I or, or people that you and I know. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a big problem, man. I mean, the, the name literally says representative and how right. is somebody who has, um, whatever their background was, they went to, on average, if we're talking about a member of Congress, they went to law school and then they worked in a clerk. Uh, worked as a clerk or whatever, maybe as an attorney for some amount of time, but probably more likely adjacent to politics just so they could enter into politics at some point. Right. To me, that person's never had a real job in their life. That's not a real job, right? And I'm not saying no. they, they didn't struggle financially coming out of law school with debt, working as a clerk, not making any fucking money. I'm sure they had that kind of struggle to some degree, at least, right. at least some of them, right, that weren't trust fund kids. But that's not... Man, come on now. That's that's like how, how are you supposed to go to D, to Washington and represent actual human beings if if that's right. the experience you have? Like uh, uh, I just don't understand it, man. I mean, I feel like I I feel like we are we we do a very poor job of choosing people to lead us, uh, unfortunately. Right. Um, and I you know on the right, a big problem is people just don't want to be led. They don't want to be bothered, right? This laissez-faire attitude. I don't like just, I'm going to go into the woods and do whatever and blah, blah, blah. Nobody's going to bother me. It's like, okay, that doesn't, that doesn't work anymore. Like the world is too small now for that shit to work anymore. So you, and, it, and it's, this shit is cyclical. It happens all, it happens probably I think in a 200 year cycle, but Plato said 2000 years ago that if you refuse to take part in your own government, government, you're doomed to be ruled by fools. That's what he said 2000 right. years ago, right? That's a principle that, that it, it persists to this day. Um, and since you brought up vote for America, this, and you're a hunter as well. So am I, this is the, the numbers that I see from this organization are fucking crazy. So explain to me exactly what's going on. So vote for America. We, we target hunting, fishing, military, police. There's a lot of different genres that we're going after, but basically it's the, the silent majority of Americans that just want to live their life and be left alone and raise their kids. But, you know, that's part of why we have the dumpster fire that we do today is because we've sat by so long and been silent that we've had a 3% of people that screaming as loud as they can be. But for hunters, we have almost 10 million hunters that aren't registered to vote. 515,000 in, in Pennsylvania. It's, it, it's utterly ridiculous. And uh, so Vote for America is using uh, personality, social media personalities to speak to these groups where they consume their content to turn out the vote. We don't endorse candidates. We, we know mathematically speaking that if, if uh, the followers go and vote that conservative, conservative leading voters, you know, we're going to come out okay. But uh, we've been hammering away. We had a great, uh, great meeting with Sean Ryan and Franklin uh, this past Wednesday. That dude gets it. Um, but yeah, we're going to drive voters to the polls like never before. And I had to, I had the privilege of uh, eating breakfast with Clint Trial. I believe you know mm -hmm. uh, Clint. And uh, one of the things he 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 told me, and quickly you learn maybe you should pay attention to this guy, right? After a few minutes of talking to him. But he began to describe to me how much he despised and how much it disgusted him, these people burning the flag that he fought for and, and marching in the streets and just every everything Marxist woke that they stood for churned his stomach. And you could see his facial expressions on this dude, like, holy shit, just the emotion coming across. And he said, you know what? We can live our lives and we can be left alone. We can raise our kids. We can stay up. We can do whatever we want. As long as every two and four years we take a fucking hour to go vote, we can crush these people mm. and they can march in the sun, they can get rained on, they can wear their vagina hats, they can do whatever the fuck they want to do, and we can crush them and be left alone the other 364 days a year or whatever it comes out to be. And it was a very, very powerful message from Clint of, of just, you know, take that one day. And, and honestly, it's not enough, like... You know, you want a cookie because you went and fucking voted? You're supposed to go vote. 
You know, that's what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, I had never been to jail before. Well, you're not supposed to go to jail. As conservatives, it's not enough for us to just vote anymore. You got to get involved. You don't have to march on Saturday. You don't have to fucking go door to door. But all of us know one motherfucker that didn't vote last time. Mm -hmm. Every single one of us knows one person. I'm not talking about you and Aunt Pam, who Aunt Pam votes every damn year going and voting. I'm not I'm not trying to save gas because y'all are carpooling. I'm talking about grumpy ass Uncle Steve. You and Aunt Pam go load grumpy ass Uncle Steve up and take his ass to vote. And anything short of a federal kidnapping charge, I don't give a shit what it is. Go vote. I, I don't even care if you don't believe in voting. You go get your buddy, load up, go vote, drink a beer, go to range, whatever. But uh, it, it's it's not enough for us to just vote anymore. You got to get involved. You don't have to send money, but you damn sure know one person that didn't vote last time. And when you look at the numbers of hunters that live in these states, or you look at uh, like Tim Sheehy in, in Montana, I mean, there's there's uh, eighty nine thousand veterans that live there. You know that race will be determined by four to six thousand votes. If, if a small percentage of these veterans go load up one person, he wins that race, guaranteed. Same, same with North Carolina with 703,000 veterans that are there. You know, the vet, the veterans really have way more power than the damn hunters because veterans vote at over 75% when they're active duty. But when they get out, when they get out, that number can sometimes fall to as low as 33%, you know, depending on what state it's in. But the veterans, if you ever give a veteran mission and purpose and they haul one person to the polls or they get – they will haul people to the polls all 30 days like of early voting. So the veterans are a huge key to us taking our damn country back. And make no mistake, it will be the veterans and gun owners that set this country back on course one way or the other. But uh, Vote for America, we're going to drive our people to the polls in numbers you've never seen. You ever heard the story of um, Charlie Wilson? You know who that is? Charlie Wilson. Yeah, I do know who Charlie Wilson he is. He was, uh, I think, first congressional district near Lufkin, Texas. Um, he's a congressman. He's the guy that kind of set up the whole um, funding the Mujahideen stuff to fight right. Russia. Um, <clears throat> he, um, th this is, the story is in the, the movie, Charlie Wilson's War, but it's a real story. It, this, this part wasn't actually fluffed up for Hollywood. There was some, like, long-term incumbent um, in his city and his dog got loose a couple of times and he, he suspected that Mr. Hazard had killed his dog. Right. So, um, he fucking got his, he was 13 years old. He had a farmer's license, right. Which is, I, I think that's still a thing. It's I, in South Carolina. It was, I think I had a license at 14, but, um, he had a farmer's license at 13. So he got his dad's truck and he drove 90 people, most of them black, to the polls to vote against this guy. He goes, I don't want to influence your vote or anything, but I just want to let you know that Mr. Hazard killed my dog, right? Killed my dog. Yeah. So uh, Hazard lost the election by 20 votes. And it's yeah. like, look, like the, the stakes around us right now are quite a I love my dogs too, but the stakes around us are quite a bit uh, higher right now than a dead dog, right, frankly. Like our, our, our Republic is in danger right now in a lot of ways. So you, there's, there's absolutely no excuse for you not to vote. There's no excuse for Zero. you not to grab people and, and take them as well. Yeah. Dan, the, the break in point for me is, you know, I live in a small town. I don't lock the doors of my house. You get sick. People bring you food. It's, it's just a great, it's, it's America, right? It's, it's small town mm -hmm. America. And we've always, you know, the church has had like meals on wheels for elderly people or somebody that's sick. And, you know, they take 20 or 30 meals out. Uh, and, and, and I've been here predominantly all of my life where my parents have been here. For the first time in my adult life, we have food lines in my hometown. You know, church members formed a 501c3. And on Fridays, starting at 630 in the morning, people start lining up. They don't start giving away food until 11. Mm. They don't start giving away food until 11. We're, t we're talking about the first time I want to say it was 700 people. You know, it, it's around 1,200 people that come through the line on Fridays. And they don't even know what they're going to get. They don't know what food and produce or, or canned goods. or They, they don't know. It, it's uh, I, I want to say they uh, work with Second Harvest Food Bank or something. But when you when you drive past the line, you see the, the retired people that are on fixed incomes. You mm -hmm. see the grandparents that have got the kids or the mom that's got the car loads of kids. And that, that's the line at the beginning of the day. But at four o'clock in the afternoon, you see the school teachers in line. 
you know, driving through. And, uh, you know, the church came up with a great marketing thing, you know, hey, this food's going to go to waste. Everybody needs to get it because, you know, proud people don't want to admit that they need help. Mm -hmm. But I got news for you. You don't get in line at 630 in the morning and wait till 11 because you don't want food to go to waste. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's an actual need there. And that has never happened in my adult life. And that's happening in my hometown right now. I've seen it. You know, you've seen it in big cities. It's, it's not unusual to see it in big cities. But to see that happening here, because they say the food prices are up 25 percent or 22 percent. Well, that's bullshit because a pack of bacon used to be 16 ounces and it's now 12. Right. You got to tack on 25 percent because of shrinkflation and your gas prices are up and your freaking rent prices are up and everything else. So people who are right on the margin of working and are paying childcare versus going on some form of, of government assistance that don't have a lot of disposable income, they are getting fucking killed. Yeah. They are absolutely getting killed. And I'm fortunate, right? Gas prices, it used to cost me 800 bucks to fill my boat up. Now it's $1,600. You know, um, ga gas prices aren't going to make or break me, but it is killing the working class in America. And, and I see it every single day. Yeah, and there's only one way out of this stuff. It's been the same way historically every single time we've got into an issue like this, and it's deregulation, right? I mean, absolutely. Lower, letting people keep more of their own money is the only way to handle this problem, right? To, to get rid of bureaucracy and things like that. <clears throat> but it's going to be a fight. It's going to be an uphill battle because you can hear, I don't know if you've been paying attention to the DNC, but you can hear these people talking, Michelle Obama talking about um, how there shouldn't be generational wealth. Her daughter has a net worth of $10 million. She's 19 years right. old. Like, fuck right. off, right? She said yeah, that her- With her, her three houses. Yeah, yeah. She said her parents were always suspicious of people who took more than what they need. She's got a $12 million second home in Martha's Vineyard. Fuck off, right? But this is yeah. stuff right out of the Marxist playbook. This- um, uh, uh, to each their, uh, uh, from, from each according to their ability to each according to their need. That is literally Karl Marx talking. Right. That, that's, it's, it's not a matter of like, oh, her policies aren't actually Marxist. She's just saying that. like, that's a literal quote from fucking Karl Marx. So the, those are the stakes, folks. You can sit, at, sit in your tree stand and pretend like the world isn't crumbling around you or you can get off your fat fucking ass and go yeah. vote. That's really yeah. that simple. Yeah. Yeah. Andy Frisella said it best. And he's like, you think you're going to stay up on your 40 acres and shit? Well, none of you motherfuckers are Rambo. They're going to come for you. Right. And it's through regulation. It's through everything else. And, you know, when they keep us divided, that's that's the secret. You know, they keep us divided and uh, we've got to stand together. We've got to speak with one voice and we've got to turn out and vote like we've never voted before. Yeah. And uh, tell everybody. Um, well, let's go back through it. Tell everybody first where they can find. Uh, all the information on Vote for America and stuff like that. It's vote the number four America.org. Uh, you can go to that. You can check your registration. We do not collect. Uh, it's got a spot in there for your phone number, your email address. It's optional. You don't have to fill it out. We're not in the data collection business. We're in the damn getting people to vote business. Right. But vote for America. And the vote for America, you put your hand up. Everybody to thumb. Everybody knows one person that didn't vote. Mm. Find that one person. And then challenge four of your friends to do the same. You do that, they can't mathematically overcome us uh, when we vote in twos. Mm. And again, we're not talking about Aunt Pam. Go get grumpy old ass Uncle Steve's ass. Yeah. Um, and then uh, your personal businesses. Remind me what those are and tell everybody where they can find that stuff. So don't call me. Don't look for me till like... Uh, February of next year, yeah. anything social. Like well, I have literally turned down so many, uh, so many different uh, businesses. We, we don't, I don't have time for that right now. And uh, again, these days I, I pick and choose who I work with. I really work more than I want to. Uh, but anything social, uh, my personal Instagram page is Yeti Man 10. This thing for my dog that's been whining through this whole thing. Uh, I've had 300,000 follower pages deleted. Uh, because of social media censorship. That's another thing I'm super happy about. Andrew Bailey, that dude's fixing to crush them. But uh, yeah, anything social or you, you can send me a DM on my on my Instagram page. Great, man. Well, look, uh, thanks for coming today. I really appreciate the conversation, all the good info and shit like that. Um, just as a reminder, don't let this go in one ear and out the other. I mean, you are, you, you, it, it's, the it's not always true in, 
human life that you can put you can be put in charge to some degree of your own destiny oftentimes you're affected by circumstance outside of your control but what you can control is your effort and your attitude right and if you're one of these nihilistic defeated all my vote doesn't count then fuck you dude then you're gonna lose like in life you're gonna lose right that's it's unacceptable get off your ass and go vote No, nobody is coming to save you. No. You are the answer to this problem. And and I'll tell everybody this, when it's November the 6th and we're looking at the returns coming in or whatever, and you're looking at your kids and you're looking at your grandkids, did you do everything in your power to win this election and change the future for them? And if you don't find one person, if you don't find at least one person that didn't vote last time, that answer is no, you didn't even fucking try. Yeah. So that's it guys. Yeah. It's really that simple. Thanks for coming today, man. I appreciate it. Dan, thank you for having me. Yeah, anytime. And thank you all for listening to this. It's been simple.